and it's a pleasure to be here in this uh, beautiful place where this organization has been meeting, um, where immigrants from Ireland were brought over from the docks and inducted into membership immediately, as I understand it. Um, the, uh, I uh, feel a little kinship with this organization in that uh, one of my grandfathers was a man named Patrick J. Darcy, who was born in Lucan, Ontario on the 17th of March, 1882. So we did have some Irish ancestry there uh, on the maternal side. Uh, as Brendan said, I'm going to talk about politics a little. And we've been through a 12-month period now, uh, we on both sides of the Atlantic, of pretty startling uh, political results that have uh, flummoxed the experts uh, and have surprised uh, many of us. And I think uh, as I looked at the results, I see a certain similarity uh, in the patterns of support and opposition in the Brexit referendum in the UK, June 23rd, uh, in the Columbia Peace Agreement referendum on October 2nd, which may or may not have been following closely, and uh, the U.S. presidential election on November 8th. Uh, I see in all three of those elections there is an establishment position supported by the incumbent government, supported by the financial community by and large, supported overwhelmingly by the media, the universities, articulate opinion. Opposition is considered to be kind of crazy and wacko. Um, and, you know, in that situation, usually the establishment position wins didn't happen in those elections. In both those, in all three of those elections, what you saw was the, the metropolitan core, the center, and the geographic and ethnic fringe groups supported the establishment position. London and S Scotland and so forth supported uh, the establishment position, opposed Brexit. Uh, Bogota and the Caribbean coast supported the peace agreement, supported by the government. And in the United States, the Northeast and the West Coast, um, high income areas, uh, high education areas uh, supported the establishment position and racial minorities, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, as we define them in the census, supported that position. Uh, but they lost in each case. The kind of historic heartland London, uh, England outside London, uh, the Cordillera in Colombia outside Bogota, and the sort of heartland of America from the Appalachian chain going to the Sierra Nevada uh, supported uh, the non-establishment position. Uh, and that resulted in some changes. It resulted small vote differences made big policy differences, or at least threatened to or promised to, depending on your point of view. And uh, I think that uh, that's what we've seen in the U.S. Uh, in effect, uh, the difference in voting numbers in the U.S. as compared to previous elections was not huge. We've had this polarized politics with about equal support for the Democrats and Republicans, very familiar uh, ethnic, geographic, demographic uh, divisions uh, for nearly 20 years. It's an unusually long period of static partisan patterns, and during that time the Democrats have won most of the votes and pluralities in the presidential election, fell the presidency four out of seven times starting in 92. The Republicans have won majorities in the House of Representatives 12 out of 14 times starting in 1994. It's been that close a division. And Donald Trump came to the American voters and the electorate uh, and when he won the Republican nomination and basically uh, he made a deal. Uh, the Art of the Deal uh, is his book. And we're almost in the shadow of the Trump Tower here. Uh, he made a deal. He said, I'm going to give up. I'm going to make a little changes in the demographic patterns we've seen. I'm going to give up votes from white college graduates. Uh, especially in places where they've been voting heavily Republican. I'm going to give those votes away. I don't want them anymore. I'm going to behave in a way that's going to completely uh, antagonize these people. Uh, and he did so, and he lost those votes, and you can see it in the numbers in California, Arizona, Texas, and Georgia. Pretty big states. <clears throat> the cost to him in electoral votes, zero. Those states voted, cast their electoral votes, same way they did before. And he said, I'm going to do that 
<laughs> my deal is that I gain votes from non-college whites, from blue-collar people, from people outside million-plus metro areas, uh, particularly in the South where Republicans have been winning anyway, but in the Midwest and, uh, and parts of the East. And uh, uh, he does that, and that enables him to carry uh, the following states which were carried by Barack Obama, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, and the single electoral vote of the second congressional district of Maine. That's 100 electoral votes. That's the election. He made a deal. Um, he didn't make it by much. Uh, 77,000 vote margin for Trump in combined in Michigan, Penn, uh, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, which is uh, without which he would have lost the election. Uh, but nonetheless, that that has happened. He threaded the needle, um, and how's he doing now? Uh, the late Mayor Ed Koch of New York always used to go around the city and say, "How am I doing?" Uh, and he got pretty good answers for a while, and then not so good eventually. Uh, but uh, was defeated for renomination in 1989. But he, uh, how is he doing? Um, he seems to be doing just about the same way he, he did in office. Unlike previous presidents, you look at the polls. John McLaughlin will have more to say about that. Uh, he doesn't get sparkling. He he's, uh, hasn't gotten a honeymoon with the voters, uh, but he hasn't had a divorce either. Uh, his approval rating is 49, disapproval 40 or 45, disapproval 49. That's almost exactly equal to the popular vote where he got 46 and Hillary Clinton got 48. Uh, and if you subtract California from that, Trump comes out ahead uh, in the combined total of the other 49 states in D.C. Um, it, it's interesting. Calif this is the first time in American history that we've had our largest state, which for 1820, 19, 1960 was New York and has since then it's been California, that our largest state has been at one end of the political spectrum. The largest state has always voted very close to the national average until 2008 when California has been moving farther and farther left. So that tilts the popular vote towards the Democrats, but they don't gain any extra electoral votes because uh, they've been carrying California since the 1990s. Um, Trump's numbers look a lot like his election numbers. Uh, they don't look any better. They don't look any worse. They've been uh, surprisingly steady. Uh, and I think uh, we will see um, uh, as he goes by, he's not trying to create a honeymoon effect. He's being continues to be provocative uh, and to go on uh, that, that uh, sort of uh, feeling there. Um, I said that a small number of votes changed, which is true. The votes, you know, you'll see this, there was an electoral earthquake and everything. It was a relatively small number of votes that were nonetheless decisive, and when you have a closely divided partisan alignment, small changes can produce big policy differences. Uh, and we're seeing that on trade. Uh, Trump came out... Uh, and basically ditched the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Hillary Clinton said she was going to do as well. Um, and, you know, the question now is there is going to be a uh, uh, transatlantic trade and investment partnership with the EU. Um, as I understand it, that's, you know, the negotiations are considered to be in the freezer until late 2017. Uh, I'm inclined to think that uh, they may be in the freezer for a longer period than that. Uh, you, you, uh, Mr. Trump says that he actually sort of likes bilateral trade deals. He doesn't like um, trade agreements, negotiations involving large numbers of nations. Uh, and that, you know, the, the transatlantic negotiation is with the European Union. You have your Ireland's European Union partners have uh, things that, uh, you know, vetoes and so forth. Um, he, he says he likes Ireland. Uh, he tried to set up a golf course in Ireland. The Irish regulators were very helpful, he said. The EU regulators bollocks it up and he didn't go there. He's got, he's got sort of warm feelings towards Ireland, although not as warm as to his ancestral, uh, his mother's ancestral Scotland where she was born. Um, but uh, he also came out, as you'll recall, for Brexit and amazingly enough scheduled a landing in Scotland.
the night after the Brexit referendum came in, and uh, I never would have advised him to take a chance on it going the way that the opposite, he, he had predicted Brexit would win. Um, but um, I, I think that uh, he doesn't... <laughs> Uh, he doesn't have real positive feelings towards the EU. I think that's one thing that, that Ireland's got to deal with. Uh, immigration, uh, we are seeing significant changes in immigration, uh, which has been moving in the United States in the direction that Trump seems to want, in the sense that immigration from Mexico and Central America uh, has been, which tends to be low-skill immigration, has been below, well below 1982-2007 levels, pre-financial uh, crisis levels. We're getting more immigration from Asia. Uh, Trump is calling for more high-skill immigration. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is that, um, I was talking to one of you before the program about how uh, there aren't a lot of slots for Irish uh, people, citizens of the Republic, to visit, uh, to immigrate to the United States. Uh, High-skill immigration may change that. If the, Trump is calling for a system similar to that of Canada and Australia, you heard some talk during the Brexit referendum in the UK of the Australian point system. Um, this is a policy direction that the U.S. may go on that may have some collateral uh, effects in uh, Ireland. Um, the um, economy, uh, well, Steve Moore will talk to you more about the economy. Uh, he thinks he knows exactly where the economy is going to go and everything is going to work out. I'm just kind of a bemused observer who's uh, trying to extrapolate from political polls and attitudes uh, some thoughts. But I think one of the things that may be going on in the United States is that, um, as Jamie Dimon, the uh, head of J.P. Morgan Chase, a uh, generally successful financial company uh, has said that the um, he thinks the animal spirits, John Maynard Keynes's phrase, of uh, American Americans and American job creators in particular, have been stimulated by the prospect of deregulation and of lower taxes in the United States. I'm inclined, though I certainly can't make a uh, econometric model of this that uh, the prospect of less regulation, less uh, particularly regulation by many people who are really hostile to business and want to stop business from happening, um, that uh, we're going to have some changes here uh, and that we're going to see a somewhat more robust American economy uh, coming on and somewhat more job creation. How much? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think people are now operating on the perceptions that the Trump tax and uh, taxes are going to go down. They're going to get rid of a lot of regulation. Uh, they're going to get rid of the Obamacare. Um, a lot of those things politically and legislatively remain to be done. They haven't been done. It is possible they won't be done. Those perceptions, those expectations of changing policy um, may not be sustained by actual uh, developments, uh, progress, and action. So I think uh, that's a factor for a little bit of caution, but I think that uh, we're, we're likely to see uh, more job creation. Um, I think one of the things that's fascinating about the U.S. economy is that there's uh, – Americans don't move around as much anymore. We are – uh, literally physically s staying more in our communities, including those that have had some real economic troubles, and you may have been reading about those. Uh, I'm interested to see if, if that starts to change, if we get more geographic mobility, if we get more people with get up and go. I don't think we've seen that yet. It will be interesting to see if that develops. Uh, finally, uh, everybody in the political sphere is always looking forward to the next elections, uh, looking forward with anticipation or looking forward with dread. Uh, and they're making their calculations based on what the next elections are going to bring. Uh, the, we have the congressional, many gubernatorial elections in 2018. Uh, right now, the numbers I'm seeing uh, suggest to me a pretty static outcome. 
uh, in the Senate races, only one third of the Senate races are up for grabs. And basically the def Democrats are defending 25 Senate seats, Republicans I think only eight, of which only two are conceivably vulnerable. Um, this is uh, Nevada and Arizona. Um, I think that the prospects for the Democratic Party to get a majority in the Senate are very low. Uh, because of that, you've got uh, 10 re uh, Democratic senators running in, re in states that Donald Trump carried, five of which he carried by wide margins. Uh, the odds favor the Republicans increasing their Senate majority rather than losing it. Um, House of Representatives, uh, basically, the um, uh, we've we've had a little more churn in the House of Representatives, an increase in uh, the number of districts that are won by Republican congressmen, which Hillary Clinton carried. The Democrats are going to be targeting them. Democrats need a net gain of 24 seats out of 435 to win. Uh, one benchmark. Donald Trump carried 230 seats. Hillary Clinton carried 205, even though she won a majority of the popular vote. That's because Democratic voters tend to be clustered in a few central city sympathetic suburbs and university towns. Republicans are more spread around. Uh, we are sitting right now in a Democratic cluster area, for example. You will find Republican voters out here if you spend several days looking. Uh, but uh, you won't find very many. Um, but this is only, uh, the voters here only elect one congressman. So, uh, that, so I think that the odds are in favor of the, uh, of, the, uh, re, of, of the Republicans holding the House of Representatives, but that can't be considered a sure thing. Events have not yet occurred, developments, trends. Uh, so we can't see the 2020 presidential election. Right now, I don't see anything in the polls that looks a lot different from uh, the results of the 2016 election, which was a pretty close as the uh, Dublin-born uh, Duke of Wellington. You all knew the Duke of Wellington was born in Dublin. Um, said it was a close-run thing. Uh, and so we may be looking at another close-run thing. So I think we're going to see the same political players probably for the next uh, nearly four years, uh, but we don't have any great assurance that the uh, policies they seek and, the, uh, and th that those actors will be in power forever or they'll be able to sustain support beyond that period for the policies they're moving. So thanks very much.